Hello, my name is James Hicks. I'm a graduate student of psychology at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. Today I'm going to be discussing the pre-symbolic mind of Homo erectus senso latu. Between 1.9 million and 200,000 years ago, these hominids were able to achieve a formidable list of accomplishments, including working in concert to hunt large, dangerous game, controlling fire and inventing cooking, developing Acheulean bifacial industries, organizing pair-bonded, symbiotic in-group social structures based on intellectual and motor prowess, and venturing far beyond the subtropical grasslands of their ancestors. Although they likely shared simple vocal and gestural communication, they managed these achievements without the complex speech acts that enabled modern humans to persuade, convince, and influence the behavior of others. I am especially interested in the Acheulean technology left by both Homo erectus and their descendants, Homo heidelbergensis, specifically the enigmatic hand axe. This bifacially napped technology has a particularly intriguing archaeological history. Its almond or teardrop form was repeated for a million and a half years, making it possibly the most enduring, prevalent tool design in human history. These hand axes have been found from Africa to Britain, continental Europe to the Levant, as far east as the Malaysian Peninsula, sometimes in large deposits where many appear curiously unused. Stranger still, beginning approximately 200,000 years ago, these hand axes became over-designed beyond their utilitarian use for butchery, food preparation, or hunting, including both miniature and gigantic examples. Even today we recognize late Acheulean hand axes as astonishing works, the same teardrop plan as those created a million years prior, but exquisitely crafted, symmetrical in three dimensions. Today I would like to offer my own interpretation of this Acheulean hand axe enigma via the neuroarchaeological philosophy of material engagement theory. A philosophy of mind authored by Lambros Maliforis a Cambridge-trained philosopher and professor of archaeology at, the, at Oxford University. As basic tenets, the philosophy of material engagement theory proposes the mind as embodied and phenomenologically engaged via human physiology with both physical and emotional inputs and outputs. The mind is extended beyond brain, skull, and skin. The mind is distributed across and throughout material culture. A philosophy of mind where cognition takes place not in the brain, but between brains, bodies, and things, as we engage with the tools, structures, and concepts of material culture. Let's first consider the embodied aspect of the mind. When material engagement theory suggests that the mind is embodied, embodied does not mean the mind exists solely within the brain, quite the opposite. It suggests that the mind is specifically structured as a direct result of the engagement between material culture and the apparatus of the body, especially the hands. The body is merely a component of the mind. The body is not a container for the mind, but the mind is a container for the body. Next, let's turn to the extended component. In an effort to reimagine the mechanics of human perception, as Bateson suggested, consider the blind man. Without vision, though he retains his proximal perception, his distal spatial, spatial perception is limited to the length of his arms. But by grasping a stick and using it to perceive the space he occupies, he has extended the boundaries of his senses beyond the skin. He has remapped distal space to proximal space. The signals afforded by the stick physically extend the perceiving and perceived self. Therefore, by removing the blind man's stick, are we not taking away part of his cognitive apparatus, his extended spatial perception, which serves as an integral component of his mind? If mind can extend beyond the brain and skin to include elements of material culture like the blind man's stick, we might argue that the mind is a structure that embodies both human physiology and our extended material culture. Next, we'll consider the distributed component, the constitutive intertwining hypothesis. Maliforis suggests that within the brain artifact interface of the distributed mind, cognition has no location. Cognition is not a within property, but a between property. 
emerging from the contextualized processes that occur between brains, bodies, and things. Two important aspects of the distributed mind are the affective engagement and the economy of memory. As Malifor suggests, Things are made to be seen, exchanged, and deposited, to be owned, valued, and priced, to be manipulated, feared, fetished, revered, and so on. The sensual properties and aesthetic experience of things infuse every aspect of our cognitive activities and permeate our social and emotional relationships. Maliforis asks us also to consider the centrality of material culture as demonstrated in Daniel Miller's the comfort of things. The book is based on material derived from an ethnographic study of households on a single South London street. Miller concludes mundane objects help people construct a material order of emotions that gradually forms an ecology of relationships, structuring expectations of the self and others. When dealing with an emotional loss, things offer us an economy of memory. While we cannot control the way a person is taken from us, we can control the way we integrate the loss emotionally via the material objects associated with the mourned, either through accumulation or divestment of the associated objects. I hope I've been able to illustrate the basic ideas of material engagement theory as mind embodied, extended, and distributed across material culture, as cognition that happens between brains, bodies, and things, the deeply emotional nature of our engagement with material culture, and its ability to provide us with both an ecologic, an ecology, and personal relationships and an economy of memory. To complete my overview, I need to discuss states of conscious awareness. Canadian psychologist Endel Tolbing describes three states of thought associated with consciousness. The first is anoesis the subconscious or procedural knowledge accessed when performing any learned motor task that requires practice, and in many cases, a socially mediated apprenticeship, mastering the actions and performing them without conscious effort. The second is noesis, the collection of facts describing one's known reality available for conscious recall, also known as semantic or declarative knowledge. Tolving suggests that an embellishment of this noetic consciousness led to our uniquely human autonoesis, or phenomenological self-awareness across subjective time. This autonoetic consciousness is modern humans with two important adaptive abilities. The facility to call into consciousness and review our previous personal experience through the process of episodic memory, and imagining possible futures through a related process known as prospection. While Tolbing's autonoesis affords humanity a conscious awareness of distant times and places, Maliforis asks us to consider the concept of tectonoetic awareness, defined as the act of human becoming via the process of material engagement through which the self is bounded and defined within our material culture. Thus, tectonoetic awareness provides the ecological grounding within material culture that enables the material anchoring of the phenomenological self. Tectonoetic awareness represents the catalytic role of material culture in the ontogenetic and phylogenetic passage from noetic to autonoetic. The basic assumption behind tectonoetic awareness is simple. A self cannot emerge ontogenetically nor phylogenetically aside from the process of material engagement. Today I would like to propose the rhetorical aesthetic hypothesis as an explanatory model for the Schulian and Dax enigma. As reimagined through the philosophical lens of material engagement theory, the Schulian hand axe may represent the materially extended a technonoetic scaffold for emerging autonoetic consciousness, a culturally transmitted material index of technonoetic social identity, and a material index of intelligence, skillfulness, or fitness to lead with rhetorical value in structuring technonoetically grounded social hierarchies prior to the emergence of complex utterances with the power to persuade, convince, ally, inspire, or otherwise influence the behavior or attitudes of others. Preceding the emergence of Acheulean technologies, the predominant theme in the Old Awan archaeological record was the simple, unrefined, opportunistic nature of their lithics. 
As the blind man's stick distributes his spatial perception where his eyes cannot, these simple sharp edges distributed focus, pragmatic force beyond the leverage of human teeth, musculature, and hands. Relatively small cobbles close at hand were selected and broken only so far as to create a sharp edge. When the final scraps had been exhausted, these tools were immediately discarded. And as such, material engagement emerges as the imposition of highly adaptive technical forms upon stone. If Oldowan lithics were simple, unrefined, and opportunistic, Acheulean technologies are not. For the first time, instead of utilizing convenient resources in the immediate vicinity, these hominids invested time and energy procuring quality source material before skillfully napping bifacial stone tools with mediated shapes characterized by the rectangular chopper and the almond-shaped hand axe. For the first time, not only is a hominid engaged in the manufacture of a culturally transmitted form, but also imposing their own personal interpretation of a mediated plan through their unique choice of source material and individual nap skill. Quality source materials suggest additional resources were expended to attain it, and the curation of hand axes far from the quarry suggests they were highly valued. Material engagement theory maintains that as material objects, these hand axes were imbued with techno-noetic value, grounding and defining the Acheulean self. As objects of material engagement, hand axes were made to be seen, exchanged, deposited, valued, manipulated, feared, and revered. As a form of affective material engagement, the aesthetic experience and sensual properties of hand axes may have permeated every aspect of Acheulean cognitive activities, as well as Acheulean social and emotional relationships. With their hand axe as a technoetic scaffold, these Acheulean nappers may have been the first hominids to experience self-awareness across time and place. Like material artifacts in the homes on the aforementioned Linden Street, within the Acheulean milieu, where thought and feeling were inseparable companions in life experience, hand axes may have offered a cognitive scaffold for structuring and constructing a material order of emotions and feelings, and relationships and expectations between self and others. Due to the emotional aspects of affective engagement, Individual hand axes imbued with social index associated with their bearers may have formed an economy of memory, allowing the survivors of a death or the end of a relationship to manage their mourning process or divestment of objects associated with the deceased or lost. As these hand axe forms were repeated for hundreds of thousands of generations and reproduced throughout the known world, these hominids may have engaged in a techno-noetic expression of both Acheulean becoming and Acheulean belonging through the repeated manufacture of these mediated technologies. With the emergence of Homo heidelbergensis during the late Acheulean period, the continued selection for increasingly refined praxis, larger neocortex anatomy, greater nutritional requirements and larger territorial exploitation, local group size may have approached the threshold of the limited capacity for rhetorical expression afforded by simple vocalism and medic gestures. Without persuasive or diplomatic speech, these beautiful late Acheulean hand axes may be evidence of an implicit social negotiation as an alternative to explicit physical domination. These beautifully rendered forms may have emerged as a material, socially cohesive, non-symbolic rhetorical practice based on highly evolved napping skills. Late Acheulean hand axes may have in fact possessed a rudimentary rhetorical aesthetic. Instead of a display made for the purposes of sexual selection per Cone and Mython, I would suggest that these elegant late Acheulean hand axes may have been a case of a material engagement meant to clarify and organize emotions to garner the support of others, forming an ecology of relationships to structure social expectations. In effect, these hominids may have developed a technoetic social hierarchy based on technological skill, with each hominid producing a unique oratory in stone. The finished work offered a concrete statement of personal skill in planning, organization, and execution 
that argued for an exceptional selective advantage. This was perhaps understood within a group bounded and defined by their technology as an index of prestige, charisma, intelligence, or fitness to lead. Therefore, aside from their pragmatic function as technological instruments, the vast geographic dispersion, temporal span, and the highly refined design characteristics of the late Acheulean hand axes may strengthen their warrant as perhaps the most enduring, prevalent, affective, and effective rhetorical platform in the evolution of human social negotiations. Thank you for your time and attention. I'd like to encourage anyone interested in the field of cognitive archaeology to visit the Center for Cognitive Archaeology at UCCS at www.uccs.edu slash tilde cca. Our mission is to provide graduate and undergraduate students throughout the world the opportunity to study the evolutionary development of cognition in humans and other primates through the lenses of psychology, anthropology, and philosophy.